Hello, everyone. Welcome, board members and members of the public. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I am Logan Pitts, the chair of Santa Rosa's Board of Community Services. And uh, with us today, uh, we also have uh, board members, sorry, pulling up my, my screen here. We also have board members Griffin, Spence, uh, Quant, Bocalioni, uh, and absent today is our vice chair, Steve Spillman, and board member Cruz. Um, uh, today, our host will be Julie Guzzi and Shelly McClure. Uh, the host will coordinate the comments from the public and assist during the meeting and take notes for any follow up needs. Uh, panelists and presenters, please silence your cell phones and keep microphones muted if not speaking. Members of the public joining this meeting will have their webcams off and microphones muted. And if you're phoning in to join the meeting and you choose to speak during the public comments portion of the agenda, for privacy concerns, we will rename you to caller and only show the last four digits of your phone number. Additionally, the City of Santa Rosa is committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment, free from disruption, and we will not tolerate hateful speech or actions. Everyone is expected to participate respectfully, or if necessary, the meeting will end. Please treat each other nicely. Host, will you please explain how public comments will be heard at today's meeting? Thank you, Chair Pitts. Before I begin, we have lost uh, board member Boccalioni. Um, I will uh, try to keep an eye open for him to pop back in and let you know when he's here, okay? He's over here at the Finley Complex. I'll also check in and have staff check in and make sure we help him get back on. Thank you. Thank you. At each agenda item, the item will be presented. The chair will ask for board comments or questions, and then at the appropriate time, open the floor for public comments. The host will lower all hands until the public comment item is open. Once the chair has called for public comment, the chair will ask the public to raise their hand if they wish to speak on the agenda item. Those joining by phone may dial star nine to raise your hand. The host will then call on those who have raised their hands. Public comment is limited to three minutes and a courtesy timer will appear on the screen. Email public comments received by the deadlines have been distributed to the Board of Community Service members and uploaded to the agenda prior to the start of today's meeting. Emails received will not be read into the record. Thank you. With that, I call the January 25th, 2023 meeting of the Board of Community Services to order at 4.03 p.m. And pursuant to government code section 54953E and the recommendation of the health officer of the County of Sonoma, uh, board members will be participating in today's meeting via Zoom webinar. Uh, board members and staff are participating from our remote locations and practicing the appropriate social distancing if needed. And members of the public may view and listen to the meeting as noted on the city's website and on the agenda. Host, may we have the roll call, please? Please respond when I call your name. Chair Pitts? Yes. Vice Chair Spillman? Board Member Griffin? Here. Board Member Quant? Here. Board Member Cruz? Board Member Spence? Here. Board Member Boccalioni. Board Member Boccalioni. I'm here. Thank you. Let the record reflect that all board members are present with the exception of Vice Chair Spillman, Board Member Cruz. Great. Thank you very much, host. Uh, and I would like to open the floor now to agenda item three for public comments. These are comments on non-agenda matters, and this is the time when any person may address the board on matters not listed on the agenda, but are within the subject matter of our jurisdiction. Host, do we have any public comments at today's meeting? We do. Great. Please call the first speaker. Okay. Speaker, Thea. I have enabled your ability to speak. Please state your name for the record if you so choose and provide your comment. Yes, my name is Thea Hensel. I live at 1354 Yulupa Avenue and I am co-chair of the Southeast Greenway campaign. 
I'd like to just, for those of you that don't know anything about it, tell you that it is a 14 year old grassroots project that has been working to transform the Caltrans right-of-way property off Farmers Lane to a greenway of 47 acres in the Bennett Valley area. We have acquired the funds for purchase of this land and we don't expect the city of Santa Rosa to do that. They have been extremely helpful in helping us to acquire this property. And we have also partnered with groups that you probably know, city and county parks, Sonoma Water, Land Pass, and Sonoma Land Trust is our fiscal sponsor. What we'd really like to do is to ask you to put us in the city goals. We had been in them for a few years, but because we have been in a process of preparing the property for purchase and land, it hasn't been a priority. We now have 20 months, October 2024, to complete this important transaction. And so it's going to need all hands on deck for support, particularly for the uh, parks department. So we're asking you when you do speak to your council members, please ask them to do that. The second thing we'd like to talk about is the general plan amendment where parks is labeled under a section called climate and community plan. We are recommending that the parks area be separated so that we can include more specific guidelines that are germane just to parklands and including the obvious climate change element in it. We think that that's an important thing to do and parks require some specific language. For example, we need to make sure that there is inclusion for connectivity between Cooper Creek Park and the Greenway, which is not included in the park plan right now. And thirdly, what we would like to do is ask to be put on the agenda at a later date so that we could make a presentation of a comprehensive outline of the citywide benefits of the Greenway. Thank you very much for your interest. Thank you, Thea. I was taking notes there. Appreciate your comment. Do we have any other comments? We have no other hands raised at this time. Great. Thank you, host. Uh, item four is next. That will be our approval of minutes. Do any board members have any edits or corrections to the minutes from December 14th? all the way back last year. Uh, Carol, please go ahead. I have one minor correction. Um, mention is made of September volunteer hours at the Rural Cemetery. It was actually November and there were 24 people. All right, thank you for that correction. Do we have any other corrections or edits from the board? Okay. Uh, seeing none, we will uh, approve them as submitted with that change. And on to agenda item five. Deputy Director Santos, hello. Please give your report on upcoming and accomplished events. Thank you, Chair Pitts. Um, good evening, everyone. I wanted to start with the upcoming events. <laughs> we have the Martin Luther King Day um, to be rescheduled coming up uh, soon. And so uh, we are working with the city manager's office to determine a, a best date to hold something in the future, not only at Martin Luther King uh, Park, but at a, you know, potentially a dual, another park system as well. Originally, the city manager's office determined that it was going to be a really um, dangerous day to be out looking at the long-term forecast and it ended up being a very beautiful day to be out at Martin Luther King Day. So um, we understand how that happens in the in the past. We've been out there rain or shine. Um, and so I, I wanted to let you know we don't have an exact date yet, but we're working closely with the city manager's office to uh, find another opportunity uh, this spring so that we can make that happen. Um, Let's see. And then for the accomplished events, just a shout out on January 21st, just a few days ago, that the Rural Cemetery had their volunteer work day of many days they have coming up this year. And um, that is the end of my report. 
Thank you, Jen. Uh, do any board members have any questions for the deputy director? If I can actually expand on, on one of the items on the upcoming, please. Um, your third bullet sure. point there is the uh, spring summer activity guide registration for recreation, um, Thursday, February 2nd. Couple things I wanted to highlight in this public forum. There's a, two kind of major changes that we've made in recreation uh, that'll affect this, this cycle. So the first one, um, as any change, right? Some people are very excited when we inform them. Some people are nervous what that's gonna look like. Um, but if you know, especially with our impacted programs, Camp Watam, uh, Tiny Tots program, some of those programs that fill up very, very fast. Um, registration in the past has started at midnight. People have been there at home on their computers waiting to, to register right at midnight. So on that day, uh, we are going to open our desks an hour early, and we are going. We have the system set to not allow registration to start until 7 a.m. The big reason for that is... Uh, we think it's important to really expand the accessibility to our programs. Um, not everyone has access at midnight at home to be able to register online. So this will allow people to call in or to come into our community centers where they where they may register um, and be able to do that at seven o'clock the same time as everyone else and not already have a program like Camp Watom full with wait lists. So that is a big change that we're excited about. The other change that we are making uh, is related to Camp Watom as well, and it's um, kind of altering our refund policy specific to Camp Watam because of how impacted it is. And because we know that there's a common practice by some to not know what all their summer plans are yet. And so they will book every week of the summer. Um, and then as they make vacation plans or different things come up, then they start withdrawing. So I had staff pull up information. We issued 500 withdrawals, wait list management, everything uh, for Camp Watam just last summer. That's a lot of staff time. Uh, it's, you know, those are going down to finance for, you know, refunds process. I mean, it involves a lot of staff and a lot of different pieces. So with Camp Watom, because of the nature of how impacted it is and, and, and the nature of how many of those transactions we're issuing, uh, the, the one week period up, up, our general policy is up to a week, you get a full refund. And then within that period, there's a $25 refund fee um, or cancellation fee. And then within three days, it's, it's uh, we keep the whole because we don't have time to refill it. So with Camp Watom, there will now always be a $25 um, cancellation fee um, after registration is done. So a couple updates I wanted to highlight and kind of give you a little bit of background as to why Recreation has looked at those two and, and made those uh, changes to our registration. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, you don't want to be Ticketmaster with that midnight uh, deadline. So we don't want a Taylor Swift situation here. Um, do we have any other comments or questions for Jeff? Great, thank you. We'll move on to the next item, Director Updates. Deputy Director Santos, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Pitts. So um, first and foremost, I uh, just wanted to say many, many thanks to our outgoing board member, Terry Griffin. This will be her last uh, month meeting with us. And I uh, just want to say thank you so much. Your technical expertise and your good nature have been much appreciated and you will definitely be missed. Um, on that note, uh, Council Member Okrepke did appoint Paul Castillo um, to this position on our board, so we look forward to meeting him virtually in February. Um, so looking forward to hearing more from him and uh, meeting him and seeing, us, seeing him at the board in February. Um, let's see. And the other thing is we still, you know, uh, Board Member Spillman, um, has decided to leave the board. And so we will be working with the clerk of the board to see if we can find uh, work with council member McDonald to see if she has appointed anybody. I didn't hear that at the council meeting last night, but I might've missed it. There was a lot. So I'll, I'll be checking in to see if we, if we have another appointment. Um, although Mr. Spillman had recently left. So I don't know if uh, council member McDonald has been able to have that time to, um, to do that work. So we'll keep you posted on that. Um, let's see. The Also, last night at council, um, the mayor did not announce any new chairs or vice chair, uh, et cetera, for boards and commissions. So the direction from the city manager is to continue with our current chairs until such time as we have direction from the mayor on the chair appointments to this board as well as others. So. Keep that in mind as, as we roll forward into February when we're looking at the 
actual appointments and for our new our newest member uh, Castillo to join as well. Um, on the project side, uh, council approved a grant application to the boating and waterways, uh, the State Department of Boating and Waterways for us to um, replace the boat dock at Lake Ralphine at Howarth Park. Um, the, the boat dock is being undercut. And so it's kind of the end of it's kind of floating in water and it's being undercut really near the edges as well. So it's been a long time coming. I've I've looked at this situation every two years, I think, since I've been here and we're like, yep, yeah, it needs to get fixed. And this is a fantastic opportunity to take advantage of this uh, matching grant. And so we asked for about $370,000 from the grant and the city would be putting in um, just a bit more than that, about $391,000 so that we get um, uh, a better competitive rate on our grant application than others if you put a little bit more in. So we'll keep you posted if we do receive that, but it would, um, it's would it been a long time coming. So it's a project we're hoping to receive from the Boating and Waterways. Um, the We have upcoming at Council on the 28th of February, uh, approval of the South Davis Master Plan that this board approved previously. So that should be, should going, should be going on the 28th of February. I think it's the 28th. <laughs> I'll make sure I got the right date here. I'm sorry. Um, originally scheduled for the 14th and um, quite a few items were moved to the 28th to make sp space in the calendar. So correct, the 28th. The other thing is you may have seen an article in the newspaper over the weekend over the Measure M funds and allocation thereof. And um, you could, if you compared um, Santa Rosa and everybody else, it looks like we have an enormous amount of funds compared to uh, the other agency. And that that is somewhat true. We do have quite a bit of funds compared to the other agencies, only second to Sonoma County, who's receiving the largest bundle of funds from the tax measure. Um, and just a reminder to the board that the council approved the first two years worth of funding or essentially up to $4 million worth of the funds to be spent on fire uh, related damages to parks. And we still have two projects open that are using those funds as we speak. And that's the um, roadway, the fire damage road, roadway project, which is repairing um, those roadway and median islands. Um, kind of extended right away areas in Fountain Grove, as well as Coffee Park neighborhoods. And we also had the six fire damaged uh, parks project, which combines about six parks up in the Fountain Grove area and makes them into one project. They all have a little bit of work going on with those. So that is an on those are two ongoing projects we expect to be completed this year. Um, and that'll um, expend the last of those funds and whatever is remaining from that will return to the uh, general um, the main holding key for Measure M funds to be split between the um, the the groups of you know the the groups of money we decided on was it last year yes <laughs> where we have uh, fifty percent of the future funds coming in to use for capital projects forty percent of the funds for maintenance enhancement and ten percent of the funds for um, recreation so and this board really helped. Um, steer that towards the council and they approved it. And that's what we're looking at. So also in February, this board will receive a pretty comprehensive update on the capital improvement project. So you'll hear what projects we have coming up and plan to use Measure M funds for. So that'll be exciting. Uh, so there won't be many newspapers <laughs> in the next years with uh, showing a lot of money left around from us. We, we are strategically targeting it um, it's just enough money where we really need to be strategic about it. Um, it it's not it's not overwhelming for us. It's not gonna um, like what the the county is receiving quite a bit more. Uh, but we, in turn, the city is receiving a lot more than the other agencies around because of our population. And so we really want to be careful on how we spend that. And so we are, taking all those things into consideration, we'll be bringing that back for you all and looking for a recommendation for you uh, from this board for council's um, 
approval during their budget session. Um, and then last but not least, I also wanted to announce that we plan to go back uh, live in person in March for this board. Um, and, and I say live, we will still have a hybrid component. We'll still have a Zoom component to that, but um, I'm really, really excited. I know it's been a long time coming and we've talked about it for a long time, um, but I'm really looking forward to that. So that'll be um, in the same place it used to be um, in the Finley Community Center in the Cypress Room in the same location. Yep, right over there where Council <laughs> where Board Member Boccalioni is. And so that'll be much easier for you, for sure. Um, anyway, I'm looking forward to that. And that is that concludes my report. Thanks, Jen. Do we have any uh, questions or comments from the board for the deputy director? Um, it looks like we do have one attendee raising their hand. I believe that's our incoming board member, Paul Castillo. Can we allow Paul to speak, host? Thank you. Paul, I'm unmuting you. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can, Paul. Uh, uh, Paul Castillo here. I just want to introduce myself, say thank you. Uh, excited to be joining the board and looking forward to next meeting. Nice. Thanks for thanks for uh, for observing this month, Paul. Um, you only have to do this format once, and then you'll you'll see us in person. Um, so thanks for, for being here now. And I also wanna say thank you to board member Griffin. Um, your service, your long service to the city is appreciated in all its different forms. We're definitely gonna miss you. Uh, you got a big brain and you also have a big heart and that'll be missed. Um, and you're also gonna escape the embarrassment of getting up resolution, Terry, in public. We're still making you one though, and we're gonna give it to you privately. You're not getting out of it completely. So we're gonna give you some recognition because um, that's what you deserve. So um, thank you for your time on the board and you'll be missed. If you wanna say something, you can now or later in your update, um, whatever. Yeah, thank you so much everyone for the kind remarks and the resolution is I'm overwhelmed. Thank you. That's just so touching. And it's been really an honor and a privilege for me to serve on this board with all of you. Um, it's been a wonderful experience and I look forward to staying involved as a um, resident of Santa Rosa. So thank you so much. All right. Hopefully we'll see you at the Finley Center walking up to the, to the podium or calling in for comment. Um, I know there'll be good comments. Okay. Uh, moving on, uh, we will now move to agenda item seven, uh, the chair and board member reports. Uh, we'll start um, with board member Spence. Do you have a report from this March? Actually, I don't have a report report because of all the rain. I did not get out and tromp around, but I drove by a lot of parks because they're beautiful now. They're so green and there's water in the little streams. It was, it was wonderful. I did it a couple of times. So I, I sort of did an overview this month rather than stomp around in the mud. So forgive me for that. That's okay. Um, thank you. It is looking mm -hmm. nice out there, nice and green. Um, board member Boccalioni, do you have a report from this month? We can't, we can't hear you, Guido, if you could unmute for us. There we go, you got me? We got you, go okay. ahead. No, I've been uh, doing just like uh, Carolina there, that uh, staying out of the rain and taking care of my property. I have a half an acre that uh, needs some attention, so we've been working busily on that. Although I would like to uh, emphasize again that the Southwest Community Park on Hearn Avenue uh, really need some lights in there uh, that could stay on at least till nine o'clock. The city bus goes in there and drops people off, and it's pitch black. And it's, it's and they, some people park their cars there, I guess, and then ride the bus to go to town and back. And it, it really needs to get some lighting in there. Other than that, all the rest, everything else looks great. Okay, thank you, Board Member Quant. Do you have a report from this month? 
I do. I mentioned to Carolina that I got some sun on my face today, and I was able to do that having lunch on the patio at at Bennett Valley Golf Course, and it was absolutely delightful, um, both as a lunch spot and also seeing people out on the golf course, which looked pretty good. They said it was the first time they'd been able to mow since the um, rain, so it was a usable golf course, at least today. Uh, after all the rain, I was able to visit DeMeo and Galvin today and Prince Memorial Greenway. Uh, Prince Memorial, the water was moving really well the whole time. I don't know who's responsible for cleaning out a lot of the um, vegetation downstream, but the, um, the creek was moving, although very full. And I don't know how much garbage was brought down, but I'm sure there'll be a, a lot of cleanup work to do. And of course, my life at the Rural Cemetery, we had close to 30 people last Saturday, a um, lot of trees down, a lot of branches down. And uh, the community really has stepped up to the plate and is helping big time. Plus the Press Democrats been rather kind to us as of late. Nice. Thanks for that effort, clearing gigantic oak trees, or uh, trying to. Um, Board Member Griffin, do you have a report this month? Um, yeah, just very briefly, I had an opportunity to go visit Skyhawk Community Park, which is the one community park I had not visited. And um, I was struck by um, the unique layout of the park and how um, it's, it's similar to the Kiwanis Springs property uh, that's been designated for a future community prop park in that it's um, very long and linear and, and follows the riparian um, area and how uh, much of that park is also very natural as Kiwana Springs Park will be. And I just think it's a really unique um, design for a community park. So I really enjoyed visiting that park and I look forward to being involved in the future of Kiwana Springs as well. So thank you. Good. Yeah, that is an interesting one. Um, my report from this month, I was looking forward to the Martin Luther King Day volunteering, and uh, I'll look forward to the future one. I'm sorry that we had to cancel that, but uh, it is it was a, a tough time for, for city staff, and we didn't know what the weather would be. Um, and I heard a lot of excitement around it from the community, so I hope a lot of those same folks will still, will still be there for our rescheduled date. And my new park for the month that I'm visiting, that I visited, trying to do a new one every month, was Bellevue Ranch Park, uh, tucked away um, off Stony Point Road, uh, a park in the middle of a neighborhood um, that was actually very, it was pretty full when I went by. I think it was right after school had gotten out and there were a lot of students there looking like they were having a good time. So that was good to see at that park in Southwest Santa Rosa. Um, okay. Those were our, and I do have one other message that I, I would like to pass on. If, if you are going to be using your city email address, please let the city staff know. Uh, it's not required, but, but encouraged. Uh, if you're not going to use it, it does cost us something to, to have it maintained. So please let them know if you're planning to use it or not. Um, again, I'd, I'd encourage it, but but not required. So just, just get back to uh, Shelly or Jen and, and let them know what what your plans are there. Um, thank you, everyone. So now we're moving on to our scheduled items, agenda item eight, our first item, uh, 8.1, excuse me, that's the recreation fee study update. And we'll have our deputy director for recreation, Jeff Tibbetts, and recreation supervisor, Don Hicks, will provide an update uh, to determine the fee increases for recreation in 2023. Take it away, Jeff and Don. Thank you very much. Um, let's see if I, I had it in the, uh, the trial run. Hopefully I could do the right screen sharing here now that we're live with the public. Am I showing the right one, our recreation fee study update? All right, perfect. Um, so before we jump into the presentation, I did just kind of want to start off and, and explain that uh, trying something a little bit new here. Um, I know a lot of times with recreation, uh, we, we come to you guys with Hey, look what we just did. Um, we just completed something, you know, program updates, those types of things. Uh, Don is, is here regularly for aquatics updates with all the information about how many swim lessons and all those great things that are that are going on. Um, 
what we wanted to do here is as we're jumping into the fee study, um, as, as you saw with the materials that were submitted, there is not a staff recommendation. There is not a lot of clean information of here's what we gathered. And that's because we are just starting this process as well. We're, we're just in the middle of it. So we're coming to you a little bit earlier than we normally do uh, with, with the hope being just to get some, some informal back and forth conversations, some ideas, some recommendations, um, so that when we do have the more formal presentation, the staff recommendation, those types of things, um, we will have already engaged you in, in this process. So uh, hopefully that'll go well. And, and if not, uh, I will learn from it and figure out how we do this better and engage you better uh, in the process. But um, as part of that, I asked Don Hicks to, uh, to jump on and join me as well. Don Hicks is our aquatic supervisor, and he is uh, kind of taking the, the lead role at the supervisor level, uh, a committee of staff that we have that are doing uh, kind of the, the analysis and gathering data and all those types of things that'll help us formulate uh, the recommendations. So at the end of the presentation today, we will not be asking you uh, often, right? We say, here's what the staff recommendation is. And when we're kind of asking for your stamp of approval on it, uh, at the end of this, we'll really just be kind of, hey, here's what we're looking at. Here's what we're thinking. We're in the brainstorming process of it still. So we'll really just be asking for your thoughts and ideas and opinions on some of the stuff that we present here today. With that said here. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about, and I'll have Don kind of cover this because he's he's leading the way, is what is the strategy, kind of how we're approaching evaluating this and, and looking at uh, formulating, gathering data and formulating an idea of what could be our staff recommendation. So Don, if you want to jump in and, and cover our evaluation strategy. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Chair Pitts and board members, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Uh, I always enjoy uh, coming to the Board of Community Services meeting. Um, so this fee study, um, just for your information, we have not had recreation fees uh, studied or updated since we uh, conducted a fee study in early 2017, uh, resulting in recommendations going to the City Council and then uh, being approved for the budget year 17-18. So it's been a while. Uh, so it's about time we we did that again. Uh, a lot a lot has happened since then. Uh, impacts from COVID, increases in cost of during of doing business here for recreation, including minimum wage increases, which increases the costs, inflation, etc. So uh, we have formed a little committee with other staff, um, and uh, we feel it's important to research what other similar cities are doing in the way they structure their fees and also what, um, what they're charging uh, so that we can make um, an educated decision on any, any changes or recommendations uh, that we should be doing in our city. So, so that's sort of a little bit of what we're trying to do because um, it's been a while and uh, we want to be, uh, we want to bring back revenue in. We want to be, uh, um, good stewards of uh, taxpayers' facilities and, and try to bring in a little more revenue if there's that capacity. Um, so who are we, who are we studying? Uh, the cities are, we are studying are in two groups. There's one group um, of similar size cities, similar demographics to our city. Uh, and that's, we're looking at nine, and that's in California. So there's about nine of those cities. And then the second group is um, cities in local Sonoma County. Uh, because they're they're our local direct competitors, and they they can have a direct effect on what we what we charge to our local uh, customers. So um, so that's a total of sixteen cities we're really taking a close look at. Um, so we're in the middle of that. We've been getting some information back. Um, the fees we are studying, researching are primarily the fees in the on that spreadsheet that is attached to the. To this presentation, and that's that was the recommendation uh, back in 2017. So they're the fees we're looking at. Um, things like room rentals fees, picnic area fees, uh, drop-in fees for aquatics, power park, seniors, etc. Uh, we're also taking a look to see what what other cities are are. Um, whether they're charging us a, a different resident fee to a non-resident fee. You know, we're looking at that closely. Um, so the barcoded classes that we have on our activity guide are not fees that uh, we take to city council. Um, we have um, 
we have the ability to adjust those fees as we see necessary uh, in recreation. So it's, I just wanted to make sure you, you saw that uh, spreadsheet so you could see the types of fees that we are studying and researching. And from this study, we, we will come back with uh, looking at what trends are and then what capacity we might have to uh, increase our fees. And then, then there is even some fees that we're going, wow, you know, maybe we can eliminate that fee and we don't need that fee anymore. So we're looking at that also and comparing to other cities. Thank you, Don. Um, so touched on this a little bit, but you know, some of the program areas, again, not all of our fees are council approved fees. Uh, Don mentioned the contract instructor fees. Those for obvious reasons, right? We're, we're individually contracting with someone to provide a program. So uh, the cost recovery that the city needs, the, the cost recovery that the contract instructor, that's gonna negotiate what those look like. And so for us to, it's just not feasible for us to take that entire activity guide of all those programs that we offer uh, to council on a regular basis. So uh, department level, we do have the, the authority to, to negotiate those. There's also a couple of things like uh, our concession stands where, right? I mean, we can't take the cost of a corn dog to council every time um, you know, it costs us more to acquire the corn dog. So um, there are a few things that are at the department level, but as you saw in the attached uh, master schedule fee, there's still quite a few fees, eight pages of them um, that do fall under the council uh, council approved uh, schedule. So uh, as we look at the different program areas, again, facility rentals, that's, you know, the room rentals, uh, it's the equipment, it, it's some unique things like Rosie the trolley, um, our historic buildings, um, commissary kitchens is is a big big topic in the community right now, and um, things like Bayer Kitchen and and some things that we really need to to look at not just on a fee schedule, but on um, you know Don touched on this a little bit where as we're going through this process, it, it's also and and very curious to get some feedback on this is what should be driving this right? So commissary kitchens is a good example. Is what do we want out of our commercial kitchens? Um, do we want it to be a, a business model where there's a cost recovery analysis of what we should be recovering and businesses using that to, to operate business? Do we want more of a community service aspect to it where it's more available to the public? Do we want some type of programming that is a uh, incubator for small businesses? So, so there's a lot of different factors to look at these things as opposed to just putting a price tag on something. Um, and we're kind of going through that process as we look at this as well as um, in, in these different pr uh, program areas. Um, park permits is another area where we've seen tremendous growth. Uh, you know, Don mentioned one of the factors that's changed since one of the many factors that's changed in 2017 is, is COVID and the impact that COVID had on our community and how we do things, including how we celebrate and gather with people. Um, we've seen a decrease because we weren't doing large events. So we saw a decrease of park permit revenue because we weren't having the very large events while we were spending really more time on it because we were issuing far more park permits, a lot of small things for family gatherings and those types of things, as opposed to the very large uh, races and, and those types of uh, you know, uh, large uh, fundraisers and, and big events in the park. So uh, continue to evaluate that and again, look at trends. In general, that's a fairly new area for the city um, as the special permits and, and policy um, has only been within the city for about a decade. So not only are we evaluating what's changed, but we're evaluating something that we put in place uh, about 10 years ago um, and looking at how it's actually been used by the public and, and what's going on. Um, aquatics, uh, certainly, right, there's a, a, a list of fees there that are, are program-related fees on the aquatic side. So that's really, again, one of those comparison things, um, as well as the what's the purpose um, as we look at the different uses of so many different uses that we have for aquatics. Um, Howard Park operations is always an interesting one, and, and we'll touch on that a little bit more in the last slide. Um, but Howard Park is such a unique feature. We're not going to find a lot of other cities to compare something like Howard Park operations to with the train and carousel and those types of things um, where, where we could have that comparison in, in other ways. So again, I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more in a future slide. And then our senior programs, um, and, and again, another area where it's, um, you know, senior programs are, are generally subsidized. Um, uh, higher level of, of the programming that we provide, you know, youth programs and, and senior programs are two of the things that are subsidized more than, than other uh, recreation programs. Um, and again, as we're evaluating that, uh, making sure that we're, we're cautious of the fact that we don't want to be pricing seniors out of participating in these programs and coming to our senior center um, and, and doing those things. So again, a lot of layers that we look at as we're trying to evaluate um, what to do here. 
Uh, Don, I don't know uh, if you want to chime in a little bit. Again, we don't have all the data in, in nice you know, graphs and, 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 and that way to lay out to you. But Don, if you wanted to kind of touch on some of these program areas and any trends that we're starting to see in the early stages of, of gathering the data. So we're not only looking at sort of like increasing or, or looking at the price of our programs, but how they're structured, because we're we're going, is there a better way? Because uh, some people say, wow, you've got so many fees, it's complicated. We're looking at ways that we might be able to simplify and make it easier for our staff at the desk and things like that that can save time and time is money. So so it is interesting. Uh, you know, we uh, we fully observe the, uh, the, the the case system, which is copy and steal everything. Oh, no, so it's collaborate and share everything. That's right. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so there's lots of great... Uh, uh, agencies and cities out there that have some great ideas. So, so we were collaborating with uh, other agencies to to find out if there's better ways of, of doing business uh, that are better for us. So that's part of the study as well. And there's some interesting things that are starting to come back there. Um, the non-resident versus resident, it's interesting, about almost 60% of other of the agencies we're studying do have non-resident and resident rates there. So they're creating a non-resident rate, which is a little more expensive to, and giving a bit of a discount to our residents because they pay taxes. And so, you know, we're sort of looking to see what, what other, other agencies are doing there, but about 60% do have that type of differential in fees. Um, prior to 2017 here, I remember we had conversation about, you know, what should we be charging youth and kids versus adults? And there was, you know, we conversation around wanting to make sure it's affordable for the kids, kids programming. And so it's interesting looking at other cities that have had that same conversation and, and you know, charging a little bit more for the adult programming, but um, uh, having it more affordable for um, the youth and, and seniors as well. And so we're sort of looking at that. And so um, there's definitely that emphasis in a number of the cities we're researching is that they want to uh, make it affordable for the youth, especially. Um, I think that's about all as far as the trends. Oh, so it is trending actually that we're we're in the middle range in a lot of our fees, and so there could be a little bit of room to increase our fees to bring in, bring in a bit more revenue. Uh, that's where we sort of look a little more closely at our local competition. There has been a situation in the past where we've increased fees, and then all of a sudden. Uh, there's less enrollment and revenue goes down because uh, that sort of elasticity of demand or whatever, you know, um, what's the what's the threshold um, for our customers, you know, what's the price cap that they're willing to pay. Um, and so we want to make sure that we don't set a price that then ultimately reduces our revenue and our attendance. Um, but looking closely at our neighbors, uh, our, our neighboring cities, then see what their um, what their new um, rates are for for classes and programs. So that's where we're at right now. But really looking forward to getting any great questions and any um, perspective from you guys that that could that could direct us in a little different area as we continue our study. All right. Thanks, Don. So. Next couple of slides to just kind of go over some of the, the brainstorming and conversations that we're having um, that maybe help kind of uh, get the get those wheels churning in, in your guys' heads of some of these conversations and, and maybe allow you to, to contribute in there. So um, there are a long list of, again, it's, it's a long list of fees, eight pages. There, there's a long list of things that we're looking at. How do we remove or, or how do we reconsider them? So I, I won't go through the whole list with examples for everyone. Um, but for example, we have... Um, the one of the flat fees is the custodial fee on rentals. Um, and what this, this does a couple of things, tacking it on afterwards is one, it makes it a little harder for us to give people a, um, a, an accurate upfront estimate of what their event is gonna cost. And then two, as you're finalizing it, it it's kind of like when you, know, you, you get a new phone plan and you think you've got a rate and then all of a sudden there's all these hidden fees. So in some sense, it feels like we're kind of tacking on all these extra things. So we're looking at, at Kind of two options. Uh, we have a couple conversations around like the custodial fees. Oh, the third thing that it does is when they have the event and then find out that they're still responsible for cleaning up after their event, they're like, wait, didn't I pay a custodial fee? 
what was that for? Um, and, and not realizing that's more so the upkeep of the building, not um, someone to come in and, and sweep and mop after your event or those types of things. So it creates a lot of confusion. So a couple of things that we're brainstorming discussing with that is one, we eliminate that fee completely. Um, we kind of do an analysis. It would probably be something based on, you know, based those fees off of probably roughly a four hour event. That's about the ballpark where we are. And so we build that custodial flat fee into just the room rate for the hour. Um, and so that, again, be much more upfront, much more honest from the beginning and, and allow people to estimate better. Um, the other thing that is of an interest to us, um, some other cities have uh, things to do this, but this is a much bigger topic of, of getting that support and, and getting uh, council on board with. Would, if we do have a fee that's like that, the idea behind a fee like that is a facility like Finley, Steel Lane, these facilities that are community center facilities, they take a different type of wear and tear than city hall and office space. Um, and so the city's uh, you know, financing of uh, upkeep, facility upkeep, is more based off that model than it is off of a community center, public, you know, large events and those types of things. So if we were to have a fee like this, I think it'd be it'd make more sense and be easier for us to explain. If as opposed to that fee going back to the general fund, it went to um, a specialized fund for the community center buildings for something, for example, if we're charging that custodial fee on all of the, the bookings here at the Cypress room where they're having food and stuff and they're spilling on our carpets, that we would then have a special project key that we would be able to replace the carpets on a more regular basis than an office space building or those types of things. So. Um, you know, that, that type of look at those fees and what's the purpose of the fee and how do we actually have it impact the intended use um, that it would be going right back into our public building here for, for the community to use and the people who are having more wear and tear on the facility paying a little bit more to make sure that we can we can uh, do those upgrades and, and, and maintain the building for that use. Um, there's a tremendous amount of miscellaneous equipment fees that we're looking you can't get a VCR from us uh, anymore <laughs> when you book a room. So just some basic things like that cleaning up. Um, and then as well as uh, not just the things that we don't have, but again, those things that do we really, what's the revenue we're really generating for? Like we have the uh, aisle posts with rope, right? To help navigate like lines coming in. How many people are actually utilizing that? It's something that we have in the building. And it really feels like, oh yeah, you want to have these ropes up? Okay, there's, it's an extra $10 fee on your permit. It kind of gets into that, what's the purpose of the fee? We're kind of, you know, really pinching every penny out of them instead of just, okay, that's something that is available. Yes, we have that in the building and, and, and you can use it. So um, not just valuing, obviously take away fees of things that we don't have, but also is this something that we really want to charge extra for? It doesn't take a whole lot of extra staff time. It's equipment that we already have. Do we just make it available at no extra cost um, as part of the room rental? So looking at those two things, um, services that we no longer provide, coffee service fees, um, a couple things have changed uh, that have made that more difficult for us. Um, one is the, the staffing element of it, right? I mean, we are a facility rental. We're not a coffee shop. So it does add a whole nother layer onto an event when we're providing coffee service. And then the zero waste guidelines that the city uh, very much supports and wants to be behind um, made it more challenging for us to, to provide that service while also adhering to our uh, zero waste policies and, and making sure that um, we're in compliance with that and, and leading by example as the city. So it made it hard for us to say, oh yeah, we'll provide coffee service for you and we'll provide all these single use things and, and that type of stuff that is not really in, um, in line with, with that. So looking at those types of things, um, mobile stage is a, a large you know, facility, um, one of those special type equipments that we no longer have. So we're moving again, cleaning those types of things up. Um, and then, you know, tennis courts per match fee, um, you know, being more in line with it kind of puts us behind. Uh, it's a tough one for us to manage when it's a per match fee. That doesn't really matter to how the public can use it. Hourly fee is really what matters. Um, and so probably transitioning that to more of like an hourly fee so that we're inconsistent with how our other fees work. And again, we can't book a court and you know at the uh, Galvin tennis courts and just say, oh, they've got it for their match, right? We need to be able to actually say what the booking of that event is. It's from noon to four or whatever that is that that looks like. Um, so that's a, a list of some of the things again there that we are we are looking at different types of examples, and then um, a few additional uh, fee considerations that we're talking about. Um, so pickleball, we know pickleball is uh, is a growing sport and and something that is in our community and was not reflective in 2017. Um, so we have kind of in a way tried to utilize the tennis. So really being clear with that and identifying pickleball, it's 
Um, we have courts, we have usage that's taking place out there. So we want to have that accurately reflected on there. Um, Howarth Park operation fees, again, I touched on this a little bit before, but again, what is the purpose of Howarth Park? Um, one of the things that has changed, that the, those fees did not go up in 2017. So the, the $2 for a train ride and carousel ride, those are even pre-exist 2017. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact year that we adopted those fees. Um, but I can guarantee you that the cost of staffing with um, the recent changes in, in minimum wage and stuff is, has gone up dramatically. Is that how we want to evaluate it as a business model, or do we really value Howard Park and what it is for our community and a resource for everyone to go out to? Um, so something that we're kind of looking for that direction of is, should we look at, well, if we're paying, you know, from when we set those fees, it could be as much as seven, eight, nine, ten dollars an hour more that we're paying per staff per hour of operation out there. Well, at a certain point, then you have to look at raising those fees, or is the goal to say, no, that's a program that we'll supplement more if we need to, because we really want to keep that um, completely accessible. And, and other fees have come up in the past. You know, there's been conversations in the past about parking fees at Howard Parker stuff. It's always very controversial. So we kind of highlighted that as, as its own separate thing um, for possible conversations or thoughts that you have. Um, the senior center membership fee is listed on there. Um, memberships, because they are associated with a lot of those fees that we determine. Um, they're just, you know, the biggest benefit is discounts to some of those classes that we offer and that we set the fees for. Um, I do have an interest in bringing the senior center membership to a department level fee um, as opposed to approved by council. Because again, as a class becomes more expensive, that discount may increase or change and those types of things. So having the department level, having a little bit more flexibility. Um, also with the senior center, um, one of the benefits that they get is a uh, quarterly newsletter, um, the Zest newsletter. It's uh, included with uh, with your packet when we we have those come out. Um, again, that's another cost that's out of our realm. So as that cost goes up, do we need to fluctuate with memberships and those types of things? So while it's very different than saying a concession corn dog, um, in, in some ways it has some of those same uh, factors where uh, I have an interest in that being at the department level so that we can evaluate what we're offering and, and what the benefits of a membership and, and true cost of a membership are. Um, and then kitchen rentals, I already kind of touched on this. You know, well, how do we want to use our rentals? What's the goal of using those? Um, definitely know that we, you know, recreation needs to put a good emphasis on the, the, the kitchens that we have and how do we best utilize those in the community and get them used, get them used more often, especially Bayer um, kitchen um, and, and what the purpose is and, and how we should be looking at that. So uh, the other thing that uh, was related to Howarth Park um, and, and needs to be cleaned up is our pony ride fees. So really we get those approved twice. Um, I'm not quite sure why it's been set up. I think just something that slipped through the cracks over the years, but we uh, provide the pony rides through a contract service. That contract goes to council um, and the fees are negotiated again based off of what the vendor needs to recuperate in ticket sales. Um, so the fact that we've had that on the fee schedule as well has created some issues in the past where we're renegotiating a contract for the ponies, but we're not readdressing our master fee schedule. So taking that fee off of the master fee schedule so that that negotiation is strictly taking place each time that we present a new contract for the pony services. Um, so I know we dumped a lot on you while also not dumping anything concrete on you, um, but I hope it is a... Uh, a way that will just kind of spur some good conversation and get some thoughts and ideas and, and give you an idea of, as we're just getting into this process, what recreation is evaluating, what we're looking at, what our staff are working on, um, and all the different things that we're kind of trying to balance in terms of, uh, we know that the revenue generated for the general fund through recreation programs is very important for the sustainability of our city, but we also know that we have a calling to be uh, services and, and accessible to everyone in our community, so how we balance that. Um, so with that, we will pass back to see if there's any questions and comments. And, and you may see the top of my head a lot now as I've got my pen ready to go and, and jot down any notes you have for us. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Don. Do we have any questions from the board before we get into comments? Would you like me to stop the screen share so we go back to- Yeah, that'd be great. Thank yeah. you, Jeff. Carol, go ahead. Hi, um, thanks. Hey, Jeff, I'm looking at the master schedule of fees, specifically at the middle section. Um, so I'm going to go into a bit of a role play. Let's say I wanted to have a party and serve food. Would I get a person on the phone and say I would like to rent five sets of china and three tablecloths? Or is this all automated, like ordering a pizza online? That is one of the equipments that will be uh, we no longer provide. So 
uh, the list of all of those things will be getting removed. So um, something when we were a smaller operation, we were able to provide and we were able to, you know, more staffing and smaller operation, we could we could clean those and have those available and everything. And it's, it's just not a matter that we've been able to have for quite, I want to say it's been at least a decade that, uh, well, I guess it hasn't been that long, but um, that a few years that we've officially gotten rid of the everything. Um, so something that we haven't been able to provide, unfortunately. Okay, so how about chairs and the easel and the um, the piano? Is that stuff that's still provided? My question is, is this an automated or does this take staff time to book these um, reservations? It, it takes staff time. Um, so as you do that booking, um, again, we're some of this we're hoping to simplify so that the initial conversation, you get a really good sense of what it's going to cost you. Um, and then if you decide that, yes, you want to book, um, you know, that, that initial conversation could take place and you get information from the front desk. Then we have a rental team that you would actually be dealing with the rental team and really get into the nuts and bolts and the details of what your room setup looks like, how many people, oh, it's going to be alcohol that triggers insurance requirement. It, it gets very complicated very quickly. Um, and, and these add-ons is one of those things that is a complication that takes staff time. So what I'm hearing you say is that it's way more than simply um, reserving a room and paying the fee. There's a lot of staff overhead. Um, um, my second question is, I rent a room for two hours. How long is that room actually out of service for for a two hour rental? Or what, what, are, what are the hidden costs, the hidden time factors that aren't reflected in these numbers? Yeah, great question. It, it really depends on the event, um, right, and the room that you're using. So for example, if it's a small business meeting for a couple hours and it's in the Manzanita room that has a default setup of tables that are that are already there, um, the impact on the room is really the impact of the time that you're in there. If it's our auditorium and it's a huge event for 400 people and we need, or not that big, uh, 200 people and we need to set up a bunch of round tables and chairs, then yeah, there's hours of staff time to prepare that. It could be hey, we're going to set it up the night before, you know, we have to look at all those staffing factors and different things. So it could be down the whole day for that couple hour event. Um, and it could be as little as just those, nope, it's just the two hours that you're here. So a lot of factors that go into to determine that. Um, but yeah, to your point, it, it could be an impact that that room is basically not available for the day because of a two hour rental. And last question, this proposed uh, revised schedule, you have no time frame for when you have to have uh, numbers because these are in-house, but you do have to provide the numbers to um, clients. So this is something, if I book it today, I pay today's rates. If I book it six months from now, the rates could be different. Is this something you um, have available for people online to review stuff ahead of time or not until they call the front desk? Uh, yeah, I mean, in a more uh hopefully more user-friendly way than, than the actual fee schedule that was provided to you guys, because we know that's just a huge chart of, of hard to figure out. Um, but based on, you know, we have information on the website that's strictly, you know, there's a page that's just for rentals that would hopefully help it make it easier for you to see what the rental information is. Um, but to your point... Um, hey, Jeff, I have a comment on that. Right, go ahead, Don. Great questions, Carol. Um, we're really looking at some of these other agencies to see how they're simplifying things because all of these fees that just get complicated and, and it can really frustrate someone who's trying to get a, a price. Um, so we're trying to look at what, what these other cities are doing to simplify this, to make it easier for the customer and easier for, um, for our staff. And so, especially with the more of the electronic era, you know, see what we can have that can be accessible online um, to simplify that process as well. And so we have seen some good things that we're gonna try and uh, maybe implement ourselves. So that's good. And we're finding also that there's a lot of agencies that are using these, I mean, when it's big events, you know, it's like uh, they're going away from doing all this in-house stuff. And then it's, you know, a caterer comes in and that caterer has, you know, tablecloths and skirts and things and so, and so, for the big events, we're going away from that um, uh, because so many of these different agencies and different facilities are, you know, uh, for those big events, the caterer comes in and does that as part of their service. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Don. And in terms of the um, the rollout of fees, that's something, um, you know, this process, we're, we're timing it right now, we're working on it right now to um, theoretically include it as part of the budget process that we're going through with council. Um, and so looking at the fiscal year of July 1st, 
But the reality is, you know, when we did this in 2017, I was at Howard's Park. While we didn't increase the, the train and carousel and stuff, we did make some increases to the boathouse, um, the boat rental costs out there. Um, but operationally, even though that went in effect July 1st um, as part of the budget process, because Howard's Park is in the middle of its operations, those fees didn't go into place in, in uh, Howard's Park until the following season um, when we reopened in March because I didn't want someone to come out on Tuesday and have a fee on the last day of June. And then the first day of July on Wednesday, come out, and, wait, how come the boat cost me $2 more now to go out with my family? So um, we do look at those in each of the program. Obviously that's different by the program area and how it operates, um, but we would look at a, an implementation plan that would make sense for the different program areas as well, as opposed to, well, this is just the date and, oh, you're in the middle of booking your event. Oh, well, everything just went up you know, 10% or something like that. So um, we will evaluate that as, as we look at the rollout piece of it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, there we go, board member Griffin, go ahead. Thank you. Just a couple of quick questions to follow up, um, board member Quant. Have you looked at um, whether there are packaged fees that would make sense? For example, is there sort of a typical um, event or party or whatever that is more common that would lend itself better to a package fee as opposed to the room and on all of the various um, items that go with it? Or is it really, does it vary so greatly that you really have to do it line item by line item in terms of charging the fees, if that makes sense? I'll let Don chime in if there's anything else, but I'll, I, I yeah, guess I, I could go ahead. Yeah, Don. Um, when, when someone goes to rent a room, it is in a way a package because usually what's included included in that is the chairs and the tables. Um, but we don't have all of these other little little things uh, like tablecloths and skirts and, and all, a lot of these things we're going away from now. Um, so some of it is we're trying to come up with a this is what it costs for that room and tables and chairs um so we're trying to eliminate some of those smaller fees so we are looking to see if some of these other agencies do have a type of package and how they're how they're simplifying so we you know we're finding that there's so many staff hours that go into giving a tour for this person and then they they say well we want this and then they call back no we've changed this we want to add this you know it's it's just all of a sudden it becomes this uh, huge burden on our staff when there's so many of these little extra fees. And, and uh, so coming out with something like a package saying, when you rent this room, this is, this is what you get when you rent the room, you know? Um, and so that, that does simplify things. So I don't know if that sort of answered your, your yeah. question. Yeah, yeah. And just to tack on, I would say one of the things with that is as we're again, just scratching the surface and, and would be curious what you think about this is, um, you know, we do have a vast variety of uses of our facility that kind of fall into some category, right? Large, large parties, um, business rentals, those types of things. I think what we're looking at more is just incorporating that room rental fee. Um, and so maybe the things like the, uh, the flip charts and some of those things, it's like, okay, if we know that the use of this room is kind of, it's for business meetings and stuff, they're going to want to use whiteboards or they're going to want to use easels or those types of things. Like, do we tack on those fees or is just when you use that room and you ask us, hey, do you guys have this available? Do you have that available? We're just telling you yes or no, we have it available. Yeah, yeah, we've got that available. No, you need to bring your own. Um, so I would see probably less, you know, there's some opportunity for some packaging of things, but I'd say it's probably more just simplifying and saying, mm -hmm. that's just part of what we provide when you rent the room. Yeah, uh, as, opposed to, as opposed to tacking them all on as additional. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then um, I have a question about the, uh, fees for the use of the tennis courts. Are those fees just, uh, do they just apply when there are matches or tournaments or are, do they apply for groups to rent the courts for or regular days and times for the group? So it has not been clear enough um, as generates the question, right? Looking at the list, well, what does that actually um, and it has created some issues recently and we've had to change that policy. So we do wanna clear up what that is a little bit. Um, we are going more towards, right? I mean, we do not feel that these public amenities in our parks should be privatized by, you have money, you can come in, use it whenever you want. And if you don't, you have to work around that. So um, we, are, we have been, uh, and one, the fees are not nearly high enough 
to cover the cost of printing the paper and having staff in it. You know, I mean, they're, they're very low fees. So we're losing money just issuing it on the staff time and everything um, when it's, you know, a $10 permit. Like, why are we processing this? Um, so we have been moving towards our policy is that that's more for tournaments and matches and, um, you know, sanction things like that, as opposed to just, well, me and my friends want to make sure we don't have to wait for a court. So we're going to go ahead and book it. So um, it is not reflective that way, but in practice, that's the direction that we've been moving with, with those types of facilities. Okay. Thank you. And, and that puts it more in line with policy that is long existing. For example, our soccer fields, um, mm -hmm. right? We do a whole process with all the youth soccer leagues and adult soccer league. There's a whole process that they, uh, annual process where they submit um, their applications to use the fields and stuff. And based off of number of participants, and we have a whole allocation process that goes uh, forth. We're not doing it for, oh, Terry, you and your family, like, you know, all these individual things. It, it's intended for that league play, structured play where, um, and then outside of that schedule is where it's open to the public. So um, while it's new to those courts, it is more in line with how we manage the rest of our amenities and our parks. Okay. Thank you. Board Member Spence, did you have some questions as well? I was um, going to go back a little bit before Terry brought up the tennis course. I was still on events and uh, what's going on in the uh, for individual rooms. Um, I would strongly suggest that we keep it simple because so many people are, if they're doing an event or using an event planner, or somebody deems themselves the event planner. So if you keep a simple package, then they know they have to add on to it and it doesn't involve the city because you can't get the quote uh, hot deals from the city that you can from a caterer who has who does all of the issues and glassware and et cetera. So I would really like to see us get out of the um, business of having and being event planners for people, just having the room, the basic stuff that's available, it's very reasonable to host something at the city. So you're not, I mean, it's almost a giveaway when when we use the city rooms for, for something. So I would encourage us to, to not get too involved with all of the details of putting on events because you're not going to come out with any amount of profit on it. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that feedback. And as you were talking, it took me back to 2006 when I was a facility attendant. And I remember all those hidden staff time and the hidden costs to the city of me literally exactly. counting all of the glasses yes. and the silverware and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's and a lot to on. Yeah, yeah. We don't need, and there's so many throwaway or, or people who buy things and then give them to friends and the friends use them. So, you know, you don't really need to provide those anymore. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Carolina. Do you we have go. any other questions from the board? Okay, I had a few questions. Then we'll go to public uh, comments if we have any, and then any other comments from the board. Um, what are our commercial kitchens, Jeff? Where are those located? So we have a kitchen at Steel Lane that is not a commercial kitchen. It would need some money put into it to, to fully be designated as a commercial kitchen. Um, so the, the official commercial kitchens that we have are uh, two at the Finley Complex. We have the Finley Community Center and the Pershing Senior Wing have one. And then the um, uh, Bear yeah. Park Kitchen um, is the third third commercial kitchen that we have. Great, okay. Um, how often are those used by commercial entities? So um, we we had a good amount of rentals in them pre-COVID. Uh, rules changed around COVID. And again, that model at that point um, was really about kind of a, uh, a business rental model. Um, during COVID, those rules changed. Um, since the comeback from COVID, we've seen it. I don't really know how to explain it. We've seen some comeback with it. We've seen some people get permits and then uh, quite a few people will get permits and then they end up not using it. So I, I don't know all the logistics, but we're spending the staff time getting everything set up and, and getting everything. And then we're having dropouts and, and we're refunding. Um, we do just because of the nature of the specialty of those kind of the, and because we were more on the business model, 
we did have it built in where there was kind of a minimum reoccurrence. Um, it wasn't right. It wasn't the the one 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 day type of a shop thing. Now, I should clarify, right? You're having an event here or something. You can add the kitchen onto your event. But as far as like those business uses, it was intended that just so that we could manage who's using it and when was okay. You're going to be on Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, and, and so there was some some expectancy of reoccurrence and, and regular. Um, but again, kind of evaluating all of that um, in terms of other different ways. Um, I, I'm curious to talk a little bit more with our programming staff. I know in the past, um, we used to have some cooking programs. We really don't have much of that in our guide anymore. And, and I know some of that is it, it wasn't taken off. It wasn't, I mean, low enrollment and, and canceling things, but it's been a while. So, um, you know, looking at trends in the community and stuff. So again, it's balancing all those different uses of the kitchen. Sorry, I know I went on a little bit of a tangent there to a simple question, but <laughs> um, but yeah, those are the three facilities that we have opportunities to to utilize in different ways. Okay. Yeah, I was asking because I had a friend who used to own a food truck and they often need to rent a commercial kitchen to do that. And so I just thought maybe you could talk with economic development and see if there's a need for that in the city. Even ones not based in Santa Rosa, they might go to like a winery or wherever, but be, but park their truck, you know, in our city. So just a thought there. Um, yeah, no, that's good feedback. Uh, and what other cities, Don, did you look at to compare the rates? I can't hear you right now, Don. You you are muted right now. There you yeah, go. just for example. Um, Obviously, all of our local uh, Sonoma County, there's Rona Park, Windsor, Hillsburg, Petaluma, Sebastopol, Sonoma, Cloverdale, our competitors. Um, and then some of the biggest cities that have similar demographics is Fremont, Hayward, Berkeley, Concord, Richmond, Oceanside, Pasadena, Ventura, Ontario, uh, the other ones we're looking at right now. Great. Good list. Okay. Um, and uh, did you, maybe I missed this, Jeff. I'm sorry if I did. Um, did you talk about fee waivers at all and how those work? And is that like a case-by-case -case thing? Or how do you go about determining if uh, a discount or waiver is needed? So the way the master schedule of fees works, uh, other than a few examples that we gave, like the concession stand, um, these fees are set by council. The department does not have uh, authority to to waive or um, discount fees. Um, so it, it's one of the reasons to really spend some time and strategically look at this. There are some agreements. So when, uh, for example, AARP does tax preparation stuff um, out at one of our clubhouses, that is a whole separate agreement that we have in place and that was taken to council um, for approval. So that's, again, a lot of staff time to do the staff report and, and generate that, that contract and everything. So um, it does tie our hands a little bit when we're looking at um, doing some of these things. We've, we've taken some action recently because of COVID, right? Some things where pop-up COVID sites and, and uh, some of those types of things, food distributions and some of those things that, um, you know, was, was a little bit easier because of the emergency to say, yeah, of course, go ahead and waive park permit fees for there to be um, a, a vaccine um, pop-up or those types of things. Um, but general business practices, it, it takes quite a bit of staff time and um, preparation to do that. So um, really spending the time to, to get this right and and uh, and we'll continue. It won't be a part of this, but I have some some longer term, big, bigger vision things of are there some areas where some of that could be put back at the department level um, to evaluate? Are there criteria that we could come up with as far as, you know, free to the public, uh, a public good, not an individual good, those type, you know, counseling services or those types, you know different types of things that that maybe would be criteria that the departments could use then, then to then utilize, um, you know, making some of that judgment or possibly using something like this board. Um, I know you guys are in the process of looking at what what is this board and, and what's the charter and everything with this, um, you know, as a, as a uh, recommendation board that maybe has that authority with the department to, to make some of those determinations and and cut out some of that time of, you know, the reality is there's been some times where I've had to tell people, I'm sorry, I just don't have the staff time right now to to look into if we can do a whole separate agreement just for this organization. So good question. Yeah. Don? Yeah. Oh. Don, go ahead. Yeah. Just wanted to comment on that. We had quite a philosophical conversation about, you know, because some some agencies have fees where it's a 
that this is this is the rental fee, but then if you're a commercial company, this is your fee, and then if you're a nonprofit, this is your fee. And so, you know, some of these big nonprofits, they are like a big company anyway. So, you know, what is what is the definition of a nonprofit, and which should get it? Should they get a discount? You know, so we had a lot of conversation over that. So we are looking to that as part of the study. What other agencies have differing fees like that, and what's their what's their criteria behind it? So I'll be interested to see. Um, results on that. Good. Um, sorry for my dog barking there. Uh, yeah, I think that's great that you're looking into that stuff. I, you know, I'm thinking about like how the city council, I believe it was the city council action does, uh, like free fares on the bus system for veterans, seniors, students. So I was thinking like a veterans group, someone like that, you know, what, should we be charging them the same fee as, uh, as a larger group. And I think you brought up a good point about nonprofits. That'll be a little harder because um, they're definitely not all the same, um, but we still want them to use our space uh, ideally. Yeah, so I think just a suggestion, Jeff, maybe when you go to the council, kind of present some of those groups you have in mind that can just sort of be kind of an across the board discount or, or just be elimination. And then they won't have to do it case by case. Although I think that is an appropriate function of this board would be to dive into the details a little more. Um, but I think the council would love giving discounts to groups that people have positive feelings about. So um, maybe maybe talk to them about that when you get to that point. Um, but it sounds like you basically already started thinking about all of our questions. So good job. Um, Let's uh, now go and see if we have any public comments on this agenda item. Host, do we have any any comments for this? We have no hands raised at this time. Okay. Um, I'll just do a final a final comment, but I'll I'll ask. Oh, Guido, go ahead. Yes, please. Hit that unmute button and let's okay, hear from you. Okay. Um, yeah, I like this discount thing. I'm a veteran, and I can go to. To Home Depot or Friedman's and get 10% uh, off anything I buy. That might be something that the committee there can probably offer. And um, and also, uh, I have AARP and I can go to Denny's and get 10% off my meal. <laughs> so it's just you know, it, it's a kind of a good little incentive thing. And maybe on some of the things I was looking at here, also on the park facilities and, and rental if you're uh, a senior maybe we could have a senior card uh, i know that i had one to go out and park out at the ocean and the and the, at the various parks out there and and i it was got it from the park and rec here and that was that was always an incentive thing to at least get that because you got a discount on parking so i think that's a that's always a good incentive especially for older older people and yeah, also, thanks, sure. I also have an idea on that uh, Howard's Park. I've been working on it, and I'll bring it up to you guys a late, little later, because as soon as I get it <laughs> in detail, and I think it's going to be a great generator for, for families and, and uh, going to Howard's Park. It's something that I feel is you have part of it already, but this would make it absolutely fantastic. And I'll bring it up at the next meeting, and, or I'll meet with you. Uh, uh, Don right. or Jeff, and uh, as soon as I get it all worked out, so you can actually see it. You go, wait a minute, yeah, that would be good, and I'm sure that it could be all put in by community service uh, organizations here in Santa Rosa that would sponsor it, and it wouldn't cost the city anything. But man, would you generate a lot of revenue? Great. Well, you can bring that up for the future agenda items. That's at the end of our meeting, so that'd be. I think that's a good good place to talk about that. Um, and thank you for your service, by the way, Guido, um, to our nation. Uh, Carol, please go ahead. I, for one, would not be opposed to seeing a slim down master schedule of fees at a future agenda meeting if you want to drag it out for us again. I do not envy you the amount of work you need to do. A uh, couple of bullet points. COVID is still... Um, a factor in everything we do. Can you tell yet if room rentals, facility rentals will be in demand 
at the same level or greater moving forward? Is this something you're still um, kind of wading through? Uh, may, are people going to stay with Zoom for their meetings? Are people clamoring at the gate to get back into the facilities? Is Turk Round Barn um, busy every single weekend, or is this just another great unknown? As I think that would influence your pricing. The other thing is, as you do your pricing, please build in the setup and takedown time if you haven't already, because the rental rate needs to reflect truly the amount of staff time that's involved. And however you can automate, let the computer do 90% of their decision so that the staff member has a piece of paper that prints out and they go pick everything up at once and take it to the room and it's done as opposed to i i appreciate the fact that you guys are that the entire department is so gracious and courteous to the public but finally um your time is valuable and staff staff overhead is important and sometimes i think a uh, community member such as myself will take advantage of your graciousness if given half the opportunity. So uh, again, I'd be happy to see this stripped down at a future date. I do not envy you at all, but thank you. Yes, and just to clarify, uh, the master schedule presented is absolutely just the 2017 one that's in place. Um, again, we're much earlier than we're usually bringing things to you. So we've had no recommendations, nothing listed on there is something that we're thinking of right now. We really want to engage you early on. So definitely see another step where, where we bring forward a, hey, remember that conversation we had in January? Here's some of the recommendations. So hopefully uh, we'll see it. Remember it's eight pages. We'll see how many pages we get it down to. Uh, that'll be one step. And then, yeah, we'll uh, we'll show some some recommendations that we made. Thanks, Jeff. Any other comments from board members? All right, I'll share a few thoughts, Jeff. Um, I really loved what you said earlier about having this be more open to the public and not and not privatizing our public spaces. Uh, talking about like the fees and who can afford the fee. Um, that's great. And I think that's exactly the philosophy we should go into this with, uh, is they should be as open and accessible as possible and you're basically not even like you said you're own you're losing money a lot of the time and so it's not really a cost recovery issue um you know keep that in mind for the council and, and for your own budget of course but you know we're not really making we're not trying to make money off our residents or the users so i think that's great uh, i think that's exactly what we should be doing um and uh yeah i also agree let's make that schedule as simple as possible um echoing what Carolina said, we don't need to be in the catering business and handing out uh, China to folks or, or, you know, whatever they need, um, basically just the space and maybe some tables. Um, and I, I don't think most folks expect much beyond us on that. So, um, and I liked, uh, Don, that you were looking at some of the bigger cities. I think it's good to look at our neighbors just for the, you know, price of living, cost of living, but I also think we need to think a little bigger like some of the bigger cities and what they do and you know like a Howard Park is, is something you'd see in like a larger city so you just can't compare that to anyone else in the county we do it the best so um that was good I like that you had all those different different data points um okay so Jeff just uh one question I see you're unmuting but real quick when are you going to come back to us again with uh, more information so we're looking, like I said, that you know the committee's working on it. Um, you know, we're we're hoping to do it part of this this budget cycle. So that's you know next couple. You know, probably looking um, March or April. You know, probably April going to to council potentially. So uh, maybe looking at something to add shorter than this, a little briefer than this, but just kind of you know we've already gone over the details of it, but an update on it um, and what we'd be looking to to possibly take as recommendation maybe on the March um, meeting. So um, we'll continue to work on that and, and we'll. Um, communicate through through development of the agendas and everything. Um, the other thing I just wanted to bring up real quick and see if there's any thoughts on, it was a conversation I had at lunch today and you talked about, right, being accessible to everybody in our community. One of the fees that, that kind of came up um, and is very intriguing to me, and again, just talked about it at lunch, but would be, we do about 15 to 20,000 registrations every year. 
um, for our programs. And so if we were to tack on a $1 um, fee that would be, that would go to our, we have a scholarship fund. Um, if we were to tack on a $1 fee to each of those registrations, that's another fifteen dollars to $20,000 um, that would go into that, that scholarship fund. Right now, we offer scholarships primarily for uh, swim lessons because that's one of the priority, you know, life skill that we really want to prioritize and make sure that that financial uh, burden isn't keeping people from learning how to swim. Um, and, and we allocate about $17,000 a year right now for scholarships. So essentially, you know, giving us that capacity to potentially about double that and then start looking at beyond that, what are just some fun activities uh, for, for youth and, and families to do. Um, so that that's something that we may start digging a little bit more into as well and, and what would that look like and, and give us, the other thing is the funds that we collect are not necessarily, um, you know, it's an event that goes on, you know, the, the St. Patty's Day 5K that'll be coming up here um, that's put on by Fleet Feet and they, they give a donation to the city for the scholarship fund based off that event. Um, they're not necessarily sustainable in the same way as if we said, oh, we've got a sustainable $15,000 coming in every year because of our registration. Um, so something that we, again, just kind of all the different conversations we're having, but something like that that said, hey, you know, tacking on an extra dollar when you sign up for a class isn't really a huge impact when you're signing up, but it could have a huge impact on how many more people in Santa Rosa we could get involved in these programs. That's great. Make sure that you brag about that, seriously. So tell people that they just contributed to a scholarship fund and uh, maybe even give them the option to throw in more, like at the end, yes. you know, like on a, like how we have that on our tax forms or whatever. So great. And again, that doesn't um, exist right now. That's just something that's kind of being brainstormed as we're talking all these different fees things. You know, you get yeah. ideas from all the staff. And so it's like, well, what if we did this? And it's like, oh, I like I, that idea. Let's explore that more. <laughs> I like the creativity. Um, great. Okay. Thank you for that presentation. We look forward to hearing from you again in a few months, uh, like you indicated. And uh, we will now move on to another uh, presentation that we have, 8.2. This is our Board of Community Services Ordinance Update, subcommittee update. Um, we are gonna provide an update on our subcommittee process to update our, our ordinance. So that's what, what uh, governs what we do here. And that will be done by Assistant Parks Planner, Emily Ander. So Emily, please take it away. Thank you, Logan. Please tell me what you see on the screen. Uh, we see the, we see your whole screen. So yeah. I think you wanna, there you go. Yeah. Now you see the presentation and not the notes. So. <laughs> yep, you got it. Go ahead. Great, great. Thank you so much. Emily, it is your notes. It is my notes. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm Emily Ander, Park Planner Assistant, and today Chair Pitts and I will update y'all on the progress that the subcommittee has made on the review and update of the Board of Community Services governing documents. The subcommittee is made up of three of your fellow members, Chair Pitts, Board Member Griffin, and Board Member Kwan. And uh, the committee has met three times since it was um, formed at the board's meeting in October um, and has been supported by Deputy Director Santos and myself. The goal of the subcommittee, again, is to review the board's governing documents to see if they accurately represent the role and function of the Board of Community Services. And we are um, updating specifically the BOCS bylaws and creating a new ordinance for the Board of Community Services. And over the course of the past three meetings, um, the subcommittee has reviewed and updated the language for the bylaws. Um, however, we are coming forward to today um, to get a little bit of feedback from the full board on some items that um, we need, more, we need more input on before we can finalize the bylaws and then the bylaws will, will inform the ordinance um, and that's what we'll address. Um, you'll see that um, on the slide that says January 31st, we will be meeting again um, one more time before um, board member Griffin um, leaves us. Um, so anyway, and then we will tackle finalizing the bylaws and move into the ordinance at that meeting. 
Um, with that, I will turn it over to Chair Pitts. Thank you, Emily. So we're going to go over four issues today, although if folks want to bring up something else, that's, that's fine too. We could do that at the end. Um, and let me first start by saying thank you to Carol and Terry for uh, going to those four meetings with me, um, hanging out, uh, you know, late at night in the, in the city's, deep in the city's offices. Um, it's actually been, been really good that we were able to do that in person and dive into that. So I just want to thank them for their time. Um, we got great use out of Terry on our way out the door. So thank you, Terry. This really was helpful to have you. And I'm glad you can give us one last uh, effort to, to make this better. Um, so we'll go to, uh, these are just real quick. I'll go over these. We have the name of the board. We have our meeting start time, a possible youth member, and then our uh, purpose statement. Uh, so let's go to the next slide, please, Emily. All right, so we all know our current name. It's the Board of Community Services. And as we've, and we're proposing to change it to the Recreation and Parks Board. So the reason we wanna do that is uh, is a few things. It's, it's a confusing name, as I've been told by a lot of uh, residents. Um, I myself was confused when I first found out about this board. Uh, that's not really a term community services that's generally used for what we do anymore. I think it, it may have been once upon a time, several decades ago when the board was first set up. And just uh, for some history, this board was really the synthesis, the synthesis of several different boards at the city level. Um, and so they put a lot into it, took some stuff out later, um, but that was the name that sort of stuck. And so I think that we've moved beyond that, so that broader purpose. And what we talk about on a monthly basis is rec and parks. Um, and that's not, that's not leaving out maintenance either. We know they're important too. Um, that, would, that would be a much longer name. So we're gonna, it's no slight against maintenance. Um, you guys are important too. Uh, but we wanna stick with something that's easy for folks to understand and correspond to the name of the department that we help oversee. Um, so we'll, I think what we'll do, Emily, is help me out here. Do you wanna get folks thoughts on each slide or do you wanna do them all and then hear from folks? What's better for you as staff? I think it'd be kind of more interesting to have the conversation at each slide. Yeah, okay, I agree. So let's, I don't want people to forget their thoughts. So let's start there. Um, we all decided unanimously to go with the Rec and Parks Board. We also thought maybe Board of Rec and Parks. And just as a reminder, we're the outlier. We're not Parks and Rec, like the famous TV show. Uh, we are Recreation and Parks at the city of Santa Rosa. Um, and so we're sticking with that name, at least until the department name changes, if it ever does. Um, so let's hear some thoughts from folks who weren't on the subcommittee. Uh, if you have any, Guido and Carolina, do you have any thoughts on the name change? I'll go with uh, Guido's giving a thumbs up. Thanks for that brevity. Carolina, what's your thoughts on changing I'm with the name? Guido. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Good. See, we're just moving right through this. Um, <laughs> no need to keep discussing. We all love <laughs> Rec and Parks Board. Great. Let's go to the next slide, Emily. Okay, so we also have our current meeting start time of 4 p.m., um, which we all know well, and we're proposing to change that to five for a few reasons. One, uh, we really kind of need to do that based on some of the current city code if we're holding a public hearing, um, and we don't do that for every meeting. A public hearing would be like when we're reviewing a park master plan, um, and uh, we should be starting at five. And the reason I believe that the city council did that was to really have more participation from the community and to allow board members to not have to skip work like I have to do once a month to do this um, and use my hard earned vacation time. It's well worth it, but um, that is a burden. And if we're trying to have more diverse board members, have more participation from the community, um, we're proposing to start at five. Um, rather than 4 p.m. So again, I'll go, uh, that was also something that we agreed upon unanimously. Um, and again, sort of needed based on the city ordinances, but let's hear, uh, Carolina, what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, so I, I, I know that we're probably the only board that meets at four. I mean, I don't know anybody else who on a, on a city board or commission that meets at four. So I, I think we probably are, but I prefer four because it's, you know, it's easier for me. I'm out and about now to come home and go back out again. But, but I, but I understand. I mean, I can certainly take one for the team. I understand that it does need to be five in order to keep it what the other people are having to deal with. Thank you for your flexibility. That's appreciated. Guido, do you have thoughts on 4 or 5 p.m. as the start time? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can. Okay. Um, I was just thinking, I, even when you have the 4 o'clock one there, what about people that are working and they don't get home till 5 o'clock? Why couldn't we have it 6 to 8? That's a good question. Um, more, I think more people could, you know, they're they're not here. It'd be more people maybe uh, commenting on some of the stuff that uh, they'd like to hear, you know, comment about. The and I also, when I raised my hand the other time, um, I was on the commission in Petaluma, but it was the Parks and Rec Commission in Petaluma for almost ten years. And you got recreation and parks, but. P comes before R. <laughs> Maybe that's why I think it sounds better. Park and Rec. <laughs> this might be just a, an urban legend at this point, but I was told that a council member wanted to change that about a decade ago to, to Rec and Parks to, re to recognize that people should be the focus rather than the land and the park facility. I don't know that that's true, but that's what I've been told. Um, and it is possible that the city will do a reorganization of some of its departments and do a renaming. And we could also just then rename ourselves pretty easily after that. Yeah, you know, um, anyway, it's fine. But I, I'm just looking at that five o'clock. I said, but to do that, why not six to eight? I mean, it's, we've already started at four and it's only 5.30. So, I mean, we've got, usually have about a two hour meeting. Then, any, then more people could maybe be in the audience commenting, you know? Yeah, okay, I appreciate those thoughts. They will, so when we go back to meeting in person, people will still be able to call in like via Zoom. Um, so they still will have that technological capability to, to you know, step out of work or wherever they are to do that, just as a note. Um, but I appreciate those thoughts. Carol, do you have some thoughts too? Yeah, I wanted to mention for the sake of transparency, there are other city boards that meet during the workday. Um, tomorrow morning, nine o'clock is the Waterways Committee for one for me. And um, maybe staff could let us know if there are other boards that meet during the workday. Also, Emily was kind enough to run some numbers for what it costs in increased um, staff time, i.e. money to um, change the hours and it might be worth reviewing that before we potentially push the start time back. Yep, thanks for those thoughts. And just as a reminder, we're not making any final decisions today, folks. So this is just to get your thoughts and then we're gonna go back to our subcommittee, hopefully only meet one more time with, our, with Terry at the last one and hopefully we can hammer all this out and then we will come back to the board for like a final vote. So this is not a final vote. We're not voting on anything right now, um, but I, I appreciate all your thoughts. Okay. Um, anyone else with thoughts on the start time? I appreciate okay. Carol for, for, for giving us that uh, information because uh, a nine o'clock um, would be great. That would fit in with the, the rest of what goes on that you can get done during the day. Guido is frowning because he's obviously not a morning guy. But excuse but, me, Carolina, uh, I wasn't proposing changing it to nine a.m. I'm saying I sit on another city board that meets during the day and got it. Nine okay, got it. Okay, okay. Thanks, Carol. All right, I'm not a morning person, by the way. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so thank you. I appreciate those thoughts. And um, I think it would be helpful, Emily, to get information on all the other uh, boards and commissions and just, just have a full picture of when everyone meets. Um, great. Okay, let's move on to the next topic. 
Okay, so this was one that we had a good amount of discussion about uh, is a youth member on this board. So there are no youth members on any city boards right now. There is a teen city council member um, that is, I believe that position is not filled right now, but um, I'm not sure the last time we had that person. That's a non-voting member of the city council, but they sit at the dais and I think they get all the materials uh, in the same way that the city council does. Um, I, I assume they're not in like closed session for legal stuff, but um, basically they're sitting there and they can comment on things, but not voting. So we proposed um, a non-voting youth member that won't count against our quorum, uh, maybe just a one year term to cycle it in and out. Uh, but we we ran into some questions uh, that we definitely want to get your thoughts on is, you know, how would that be appointed? Is that done by the mayor? Uh, would that be a vote, our vote or something like that? Um, how do we get those folks? So we thought about, you know, of course, you can go to schools or youth groups, but we really thought, well, maybe we should give that to participants in our neighborhood services program. Um, you're, you're, you know, if you go to schools and, and things like that, you're, you're going to probably get more of the, the, um, you know, overachiever type students, which is great. Uh, but maybe we want someone who's actually using more of our programs, like in neighborhood services. So we sort of saw both sides of that. And uh, there was some concerns about the increased workload uh, for all of us. Um, and it probably would be more of a community service than a, than a benefit, kind of almost like an internship can be. Um, but I think that that's a good service for the community. So, again, I'll go back to our uh, Carolina and Guido. What are your thoughts on a non-voting youth member? Carolina, go ahead if you could. I, um, I like it a lot. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great opportunity for us and them. But there are obviously some sticky wickets on it because how do they get appointed? How do, you know, how do we recruit them? It's going to take more workload for the staff unless one of us says, we'll take them on, you know, and be sure that they're where they need to be and, you know, that kind of thing and remind them of stuff because it is going to be. But I think it'd be a great addition if we can do it because it's a whole different world they see than we see. And I love that part. Yep, I agree. Guido, what are your thoughts? Uh, you gotta unmute yourself, please. You won't have to do that in two months, don't worry. <laughs> Good, I can't wait. Um, I think it's a great idea. And you know, you might even want to rotate the high schools, different high school every year. And, wow. and maybe um, it could be something that the, the senior groups uh, point a, a specific person. They, have, they, they uh, get together like they do with the, I'm trying to think what it's called, when they appoint the, 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 the guy and the gal as a, what do they call it? It's been so long since I was in high school. Like the valedictorian, you mean? Or? Yeah, yeah. Where they, where they appoint okay. the person and said that they would, uh, the school would say, okay, guys, appoint somebody and then they vote on it. And then, okay, Jerry Smith's going to be the, our representative for the board. And uh, then next year we go to, from Pioneer, we go to one of the other schools. You know, just kind of pass it around because you get different views from different areas and what they think they should have in their area and so on. I think it's a great idea. Good. Okay. I actually really like that suggestion, Guido. I think that's a really good one to rotate it. Um, I, I still think it would be good to get someone from neighborhood services. So maybe we can try to mm -hmm. do like a scoring system or something, some preference for someone that's used our services. But I like the idea of the rotation. I think that's pretty fair. And I also maybe even rotate among council districts, but I do like the idea of the high school because we have five high schools. So it would be, they'd all sort of get a representative pretty regularly. Um, that's great. Good. Okay. Good. Good ideas. All right. And then let, let's ask actually, how would we, 
how do you think it would be best to be appointed? Should that be something we'll leave up to the city council, to the mayor? So it's just one person. I don't think we'd have the whole city council do it, but maybe. I don't what are what are folks' thoughts on how they actually get selected? Anything? Oh, I don't think we want the city council to do this. Their cup is really full. And we have a pretty new council this year. I don't think that's very fair for them. You're just loaning it on them. I don't, you know. Yeah. I really don't. Well, that's good. I think that's a good point. Let's look into it, Emily, if we can do it on our own. And, you know, maybe we can ask our council members if we get a chance to talk to them in the next month, what they think about us not including them. Um, sometimes you're right, Caroline, I think they're busy, but some, maybe they'd be interested in that. So, uh, well, it, it's very beguiling to talk about, so I can yeah. understand where they would be. And maybe it's a good, um, diversion for them that, you know, would be fun. It's a lot more fun than some of the subjects they're going to have to discuss. That is feel good stuff. They would like that. Um, yeah. okay. Let's figure it, we'll, we'll put a pin in that part of it, um, but we're seeing a lot of support for the idea overall. So that's great to hear. Um, all right, and then our last topic, Emily. So this is uh, really just wanted to get folks feedback on this. So you can read it um, and it was, in, it was in your packet. So the current purpose is the one at the top. Um, I'll just, I'll just read it. We'll do that real quick. The purpose of the BOCS is to review recreational policies, facilities, and programs, and to advise city council on their effectiveness, and to advise the council on matters related to community beautification. When requested by the director of Rec and Parks, the BOCS assists in the formulation of rules for the use of parks and rec facilities. Okay, so that's the old one. We thought it could use a few updates. It's got some, some dated terminology in it. Um, New one, the purpose of the Rec and Parks Board is to review Rec and Parks policies, facilities, and programs, and advise the director of Rec and Parks and City Council on their effectiveness. To seek public input and engagement on matters related to city parks, city park facilities, and rec programs, and to serve as an advocate for Rec and Parks in the community. So this was sort of a merger of Terry and Carol's suggestions. Um, so I think it's a good one, Emily or, or uh, if you did that or whoever did that, good job. Um, she's shaking her head now. So someone else did it. Good job to that person. Um, what do you what do you think, Carolina and Guido? Do you like our new proposed one? I love the compilation of the two of them. That was very good. Whoever did that, attaboy. All right. I like it too. Guido, do you have any thumbs up, thumbs down? Do you want to change anything in that? No, I, I like it too. The only thing that with this board that uh, I don't know if that it would encompass but, uh, what I'm thinking in my head here, is there a project going on on Hearn Avenue and Stony Point area, 154 unit, one of those big three, four story look tall complexes. And there's no sidewalk on that side of the street on the north side of the street where the kids are going to come out, you figure how many kids are going to be living in there and one and going down to our Southwest Community Park. And what they're going to be doing is running across the street to the other side that has a sidewalk, okay? Dead down two blocks to the park or, and back. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to be running across and the traffic is so bad right now in there and it's going to be so much worse. I brought it up and I was told that's not part of our committee. I think that should be something where parks and rec, but then things on the side, like sidewalks and curbs, so that it's, uh, or uh, 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 crosswalk lighting, which they're now putting in uh, for that park on Hearn Avenue. But I mean, we, we need to get ready. That thing's gonna open in May. I was over there talking to the people already and they said, it's not their responsibility on Hearn Avenue. And I'm going, I talked to somebody in the city and I was told, no, it's uh, it's not ours. That's private property. Well, yes, but you still got to put a sidewalk there. You took it over. You took us in from the county. You got to put a sidewalk there for these kids. They're going to be running across the street. You know, it's going to happen. So what? Let's let's prevent that. Let's help prevent it and get this going. But I was told it's not part of this thing. But I think it's something that should be where we can bring something up like that to make it safer for people.
people getting to the parks as well. Well, yeah, I think what you're, so we do have a board that's called the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board. So they advise, they're appointed by the city council and they advise them on anything having to do with sidewalks, bike lanes, walking paths. Um, and I think what you're, maybe what you're kind of talking about is we do overlap with other boards. And so we're trying to prevent overlap because that's why they exist is to do the bicycle and pedestrian uh, advocacy in the city. Um, we did talk about working with those boards more and possibly meeting with them even in like a joint meeting, like a once a year sort of thing. And so I think that I think that that's the type of place where we talk about that. I'm not sure how I understand where you're coming at that it's going to a park. Um, but you know, if there's like a bike path in front of the park, we don't oversee that. That's the bike and ped board. Um, did that answer your question at all? Uh, yeah, except nobody's giving me a, uh, an answer as to if somebody looking into it, is it going to be done before that that place opens up and all those kids get out there and some little kid has to get hit? You know, that I don't want to see that happen because we well, didn't act park it fast enough. Yeah, well, we can definitely ask our staff to look into that particular project. There should have been some sort of uh, agreement between the city and the developer, and usually the developer builds that infrastructure, but I don't know. Maybe that that didn't happen. Yeah, I talked. Um, I talked to the developer, and he told me that no, that's not our responsibility. So then it's I would talk. I would talk to the city because uh, yeah. So maybe you can, uh, Jen or, or Emily. Maybe you can communicate with Guido and direct them to the right staff at the city to get that question answered. Yeah, I was just going to say we can definitely look into that. It's it's on Hearn Avenue. Yeah, Hearn Avenue, it's up in the, it's an old, an old and Stony Point, which is just a block from Stony Point. An old Stony Point. Okay, yeah, we... Um, 154 units. It's going to be ready in May. Right. We can we can check into that with the right staff here at the city and, and reach back out to you, yeah. uh, board member Boccalioni, and that way you have the information you need. Thank you, Jen. Sure. Yeah, okay. I don't see a place for that in our purpose, though, Guido. Uh, to add something on that, but I think that, um, well, it's just a matter of we are, if we're going to be parks and rec or recs and park, uh, making sure that we people have safe access to our facilities. I think, well, I mean, I think even in this purpose, you could actually encompass that. So to seek public input and engagement on matters related to city park facilities. So I think that's what you just did that's right cool. there. That sounds good. Yeah, that, yeah, okay. That sounds good. Yeah. So, and I think you should absolutely bring up access to the parks. I'm not trying to shut you down at all. I think that's a really good point. So please bring that up whenever you feel strongly about it. Good. Thank you. And then yeah. uh, Chair uh, Pitts, if I may, I, I will say that we do review every development uh, that comes in through the city in parks. So this purpose, including the, the word parks in it, is now parks planning and park maintenance. We do review, both teams review, we'll bring in recreation if there's anything you know, operationally in, in, interesting or we need their feedback from it, but we do review those. So that is part of our purview um, in those. Good. All right. Thanks, Jen. Carol, do you have a comment? Yeah, I wanted to mention one of the things we talked about in our three meetings, and this seems like an appropriate time, would be to encourage members of this current board to have a more direct relationship with their uh, appointing city council person. So Guido, if this is in your district and your city council person is Mayor Rogers, I personally would encourage you to engage her um, Hopefully we are all engaging with our appointing city council person so that we can make them more aware and excited about all things Rec and Park. And this would be something um, if you haven't talked to your appointer about, I would encourage you to. I've been, I've been attempting to get a uh, meeting with her. She's been so busy. First, she was sick for things. She called me up personally and told me. And so hopefully... Uh, next week sometime we'll be able to get together okay thanks carol for that 
Um, great. Sorry about that. So I think we've heard everyone's comments. Uh, if you could move to the next slide, okay. So yeah, we're gonna meet again on January 31st. We're gonna get one last uh, use out of Terry. She's been very useful and helpful. So thank you, Terry, for sticking around for one more. Um, and then Emily, do you wanna go over to the rest of that timeline? Sure, Logan. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we are gonna yeah. hopefully complete the bylaws and move on to the ordinance on Monday and then um, Staff will actually sit down and, and draft the ordinance language and bring it back to the subcommittee for their review um, before we bring it forward, along with the bylaws to the full board. Um, however, if during that time period um, there arise items that need to be addressed by the full board, we will bring this back to you at um, a future meeting for meetings. Um, but once we bring it to you, the bylaws and the ordinance um, for your review, um, we'll have you make a recommendation um, of the ordinance to council, and then we will take it to council um, along with the bylaws and any other um, areas of um, the governing documents that need to be updated. For example, with the youth member, um, there will be, need to be changes made to um, council policy 006. Um, and then it'll, it takes council two meetings to approve an ordinance, um, to review it and then adopt it. And then it goes forward through the city clerk's office is my understanding. Um, and they work with a codifier who will update the city code to reflect the ordinance changes. So we have Great. more months uh, of work to do um, behind the scenes. Great. Okay. I want to put Jen on the spot. And Jen, I want to ask you, if we got this done at next month's meeting, what's the fastest it can get to the clerk's office after a city council vote? <laughs> I, I'm glad you asked because I was just going to add one of the things that um, you all have been discussing this evening is the youth membership. Um, if we if you decide to add that in there, correct me if I'm wrong, Emily, I think we looked into that, that it was going to be it was going to be quite a pretty big effort on our part and it wasn't going to be anything very quick. So I I I am seeing nods. If I have that wrong, let me know. <laughs> but um, if you move forward with the rest of it, we can get this um, done really, really quickly. And it kind of depends. We need about 30 days in between the board and the council. It kind of just depends on when it lands. We can even squish it a little bit tighter, potentially. Um, but I also want to have this conversation with the city manager's office to see how they would like to bring this forward to council as part of our the staff's next step. Um, so that when we meet again uh, on Monday, we have some sort of direction on, on how the council should be receiving this information. And is this enough information for them to make these updates? So I think everything but that youth, um, adding the youth member in, it can happen pretty quickly. The youth member, we could come back and potentially add that a little bit later and do the extra work that's involved because I know part of the reasoning behind pushing this forward um, is that we still have this um, requirement. <laughs> We're supposed to have eight members per our current ordinance, which uh, we didn't discover until just a couple of years ago. And so it requires a five person quorum, which is rough. It's rough on a on a seven person uh, membership. So that would be my recommendation is to, to try to move it forward. And we can still consider the youth, um, the adding the youth uh, portion to the to the ordinance. Uh, it would just take a little bit longer because there's more involvement than just the board ordinances. There's ordinances related to city policy that have to be changed that are outside of our entire, you know, our, our purview exclusively. So that was a lot, but hopefully that got, yeah. <laughs> got you some of the information. That's helpful. Thank you. So how much longer could you estimate if we did do the youth member, would that slow it down by like a month or two? What are you thinking? No, I think, I think 
Emily and I were just kind of, you know, we haven't been able to really set that process in motion yet, but I think what we were at like six months at least. That's what I was, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that I agree. That's probably a bigger discussion. Um, so let's let's table that one for now. I appreciate you uh, letting us know those timelines. We want to get this done as soon as possible, like you said, for the quorum, for the meeting time, for our cool new name. Um, and I think that that I don't I would not like a delay that long. But uh, let's hear from Terry. Do you have some thoughts, Terry? Yeah, I was just going to suggest that maybe what we would do is. <laughs> Time the ordinance goes to council. Um, we also seek council direction about a youth member, and they can weigh in at that time about whether they have strong feelings about whether that person's appointed by the council or by the board. So, you know, take the ordinance to council with everything but that, and then maybe at the same time, just seek, seek some council direction going forward on that youth member. Great suggestion. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to talk to my council member yet on that. Um, so we definitely want to hear from them. And I think that's a good way to do it in that presentation. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, thank you for going through that, Emily. Appreciate it a lot. Uh, appreciate again, Terry and Carol's time on that subcommittee and Guido and Carolina. Thank you for your thoughts on how we can make it even better. So if you can, uh, thank you, Carol and uh, Terry, very much. Because yeah. this is this is complicated. Well, and yourself, Logan, this is complicated, and you get tripped up over words. So thank you so much for doing it. We were going over individual words at times, so that's yeah. that's what that's what happens when you dig through an ordinance. Um, mm -hmm. Right. But uh, but we got it done, yeah, almost done at least. So we'll be there soon. Okay. Chair Pitts, I'm sorry, you're muted. Yes, I am. Thank you, Shelley. Appreciate that. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for that. So, we'll, again, we're going to come back to you after we have our next meeting, and hopefully we'll be able to finalize that on the 31st and then come back next month for everyone. So, moving on, uh, next item on the agenda is item nine, the committee reports. Uh, update 9.1, the mayor's lunch. Uh, we did not have a mayor's lunch in January. I hope uh, that we'll have one in February with our new mayor. Uh, so nothing to update there. Uh, board member Quant, would you please provide us an update for the waterways committee? The waterways committee hasn't met in several months. We have a meeting tomorrow where hopefully we will not only um, discuss one new project, but also have a review of projects which have been reviewed over the last year or so and get updates on those. Great. And there's finally some water in those waterways. So <laughs> great. Uh, and then the next one, 9.3, we kind of did that basically. This was just our standing item to go over the subcommittee, um, but we just, we just did a deep dive into that. So I think we can uh, move on from that one and go to number 10. Deputy Director Santos, do we have any written or electronic communications? Thank you, Chair Pitts. We have no written or electronic communication this month. All right, thank you, Jen. Uh, and now item 11, future agenda items. Are there any items uh, that any board members would like to see on a future agenda? I think Guido, you had one. Um, if you could remind us again what that was. Hit, hit the unmute button, look through those notes and, and let us know. Yeah, I was trying to figure out what, what was it that I brought up? There was a number of things. Uh, I don't, but what, do anybody recall what I said? I got so many scribbles here. I didn't have that in my notes. I'm sorry. I just I just said bring it up later, but uh, that's okay. If it pops into your head, you can uh, let you can email or call Jen and let her know, and then we can get that added to a future agenda. No problem. Good. Good. Okay. No worries. 
Carol, do you have something for a future agenda? Yeah, as I recall, Guido is very excited about something he has up his sleeve for Howarth Park. Go ahead, Guido, take it away. Uh, yes, it. it uh, I want to. I want to line it out first before I brought, bring it up, and uh, make sure that it's going to work. So I'll bring it up at the next meeting, if that's okay. okay. I mean, that's I, fine. it's just an idea in my head right now that that uh, I have seen in other places. I used to own a charter bus company and taking groups and people to other other facilities and so on in, in some beautiful parks. And I, man, this thing is great. People loved it. So I, I, Howarth Park is a beautiful park and I love that park. And so I want to look at this a little further before I bring it up. Okay, and also feel free to use our wonderful staff. You could talk with with Jen, and and uh, she could probably get some some answers to your questions. Um, yeah, thanks for your ideas. Do we have any other? And thanks, Carol, for that save. Um, do we have any other future agenda items that folks would like to discuss? Okay, well, uh, that is. Uh, if no, there's no further items, uh, the next regularly scheduled meeting of the board will be held on Wednesday, February 22nd at 4 p.m. And I just want to say one last time to thank Terry for her service on the Board of Community Services. Again, we're going to get you a resolution. You're not escaping without that. Um, and uh, thank you again, Terry. Really appreciate it. Um, You've been you've been great on the board and great to the city. So thank you. Thanks. All right. With that, I adjourn this meeting of the Board of Community Services at 6.06 PM. Thank you, everyone.